On the night of July 13, 2019, a distressed 911 call was placed in the town of Inverness, Florida, by a panicked 17-year-old teenager named Carlos. The adolescent frantically requested assistance for his mother, Denise. He informed the operator that he had awoken from a nap to find his mother assaulted in her own bed, her cranium fractured with a hatchet. At that instant, the lady was still alive but unresponsive. The young man was in a state of panic, unsure of how to aid his cherished one, and the dispatcher was doing everything in their power to soothe him and guide him out of the residence. The emergency responder was uncertain if anyone else was present in the home who could potentially harm Carlos. Consequently, they sought to ensure that the teenager would remain secure while law enforcement was en route. This startling call directed law enforcement to the outskirts, to a spot quite isolated from the commotion. With their firearms ready, the officers cautiously entered the residence to investigate if anyone else was present. Proceeding from one area to another, they found that the house was empty, except for one bedroom where Denise Hallowell lay on the bed. It was a gruesome scene. A hatchet was embedded in the back of her skull. The act was carried out with such intensity that only a few inches of the blade protruded from her head. Despite this, the paramedics still attempted to administer first aid to the woman, but sadly, Denise could not be rescued. That very night, she was pronounced deceased. The authorities were perplexed as to why someone would need to forcibly enter the home to end the life of the occupant while sparing her son and not taking anything valuable. The house was situated in a remote location, close to a lake. There were a few neighboring residences nearby, but they all belonged to Denise's friends. Carlos, the victim's son, provided a similar account. He had no clue who could have been responsible for this, as everyone in the vicinity was either a friend of his mother or an acquaintance from church. According to popular opinion, Denise Hallowell was an exceptional individual in every way. Her generosity and kindness inspired all who interacted with her. She was a woman with a warm heart, a bright smile, and a contagious laugh who was deeply committed to those she cherished, both friends and family. Denise had been married twice, but these relationships, it turned out, did not have a long-term future. The woman once again returned to the lakeside house that had been in her family for three generations. Close by was the residence of her dearest friend, Emmy. Their families had resided on adjacent lots their entire lives. The girls grew up side by side, and as adults, they maintained an excellent relationship. Denise simultaneously pursued her teaching degree while working as a veterinary technician. After obtaining her diploma, she proudly began teaching. And in addition to this profession, the woman also engaged in community activities in her neighborhood. Denise was deeply committed to the area where she lived, volunteering at local charities or independently organizing fundraisers to assist a family in need. Hallowell strived to live for others, and this gave her a sense of fulfillment. In her own worldview, a small piece of the puzzle was missing to make life shine with new colors. Denise longed to become a mother. She did not have a strong relationship that would serve as the foundation for a happy family life. With each passing year, the possibility of giving birth to a child on her own became increasingly elusive. But for Denise, this did not play a significant role because her heart held enough love and tenderness for an adopted baby. Friends, over 90% of viewers watch videos without subscribing to the channel. Check if you're subscribed. If not, please be so kind as to subscribe to the channel to support me. The truth is that she was also adopted by foster parents. She recalled the feeling of joy when she was selected from a group of children. So she wanted to give the same wings that she once had to a child left in the care of the state. Denise was unaware that she had the ability to provide these kids with the life they deserve. Primarily, Hallowell located an adoption agency where there were children from Central America, and this led her to encounter a delightful little boy from Guatemala. His name was Carlos, and he became her son. From the first glance, from the first embrace, Denise adored Carlos as her own child, and they instantly became inseparable. Subsequently, the woman even got a tattoo on her ankle with the name of her firstborn. Evidently, the Hallowell family, consisting of two individuals, was incredibly joyful. 
Carlos proved to be the son every parent would wish for. The boy excelled in school, even skipping one grade by passing exams externally. He was excellent at sports and very well liked among other classmates. At one point, he got a girlfriend who really adored him. A serious relationship was developing between them, and Denise and the girl's parents considered them a wonderful couple and were already making plans for the future. From a charming, brown-eyed boy, Carlos transformed into a very mature young man. Everyone adored him, especially his mother. They said that there was an incredibly close bond between them. Even Denise's friend Emmy was envious of her because she had constant problems with her own children. Denise adored her son immensely. She wanted to give him absolutely everything in her power. The woman herself was not particularly interested in having more children. With the arrival of Carlos, her dreams of motherhood were completely fulfilled. At some point, she thought that perhaps the boy would be happier if he had a brother or sister. They say that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Denise did adopt another child, an eight-year-old boy from Honduras at the time of adoption. His name was Angel, and he was supposed to become Carlos's younger brother. This is where everything turned out entirely different from what was originally planned. The relationship with Angel turned out differently, and the hopes for a happy family life crumbled like a house of cards. In 2015, a few years prior to her passing, Denise had to contact law enforcement and report Angel missing, as she was unable to locate him anywhere. The patrol officers who arrived first and foremost prepared a protocol and wanted to examine the teenager's room, after which they had a mixed reaction towards the child's mother and the entire situation in general. Angel's room and what they observed in it left the officers somewhat perplexed. By that time, the boy was 12 years old, so they anticipated seeing posters on the walls, a plethora of toys and gadgets, as is typical for children of his age. However, instead, they encountered a completely empty room, except for an inflatable mattress on a frame and a bucket that was intended to be used as a toilet. The window was boarded shut, and there were locks on the outside of the door to secure the room from the outside. While the police were investigating the house, Denise located Angel on her own. He was concealing himself in a neighbor's shed. The officers wanted to ask the boy a few questions to ascertain what was happening, and then a very unsightly picture began to emerge. Angel informed the police that he was treated very poorly in the Hallowell house. Every night he was locked in his bedroom and permitted to leave the room only to perform housework. And even when he went out to do housework, he was compelled to do it completely naked. He also reported that Denise and Carlos frequently beat him with their fists below the belt. It all appeared so terrible that Denise was arrested and charged with very serious accusations of abusing her son. Both teenagers were removed from her custody. Carlos attempted to assist his mom and post bail for her to get her out of jail, but ultimately it wasn't necessary. Denise's lawyer was able to persuade the judge to release her under house arrest with an electronic ankle bracelet. The entire situation in the Hallowell family caused outrage in the community. Denise was a teacher and a mother of two children. The woman was accused of inappropriate treatment of her own son. At the time this occurred, she was teaching natural sciences and social sciences at a private school. Because of this whole situation, Denise could not return to work. The management placed her on administrative leave until the situation with the accusation and arrest was finally clarified. The student's parents were informed that nothing like this had been noticed about Denise before. She had an impeccable teaching career. But who knows what can happen behind closed doors at home. Despite the fact that the woman was released from prison under house arrest, she could not work and therefore could not pay the bills. For her, the situation with Angel's escape ended in disaster. She lost her children. Credit card debts were mounting. Her reputation as a teacher was ruined and Denise's whole life was practically destroyed. It would seem that this is precisely what she deserved if she really treated her own children badly. All this happened primarily because of Angel's words, but as soon as the investigation commenced and the police began to delve into the details of the case, everything started to seem far-fetched and false. There was no evidence that Denise had mistreated her sons. She did not deny that she had spanked the mischievous child on the soft spot a couple of times for his pranks. 
this was the maximum extent of physical punishment. The question arose whether to consider this physical and whether it could be called a crime. The woman also explained that she nailed the window in Angel's room shut as the boy had a propensity to run away. He would sneak away in the middle of the night through the window and then she would have to search for him for several hours. For the same reason, she installed a lock on the door of his room. Perhaps it was a mistake, but Denise felt that she had no other options. She spoke to a psychologist about this and consulted with the local pastor, but no advice or recommendations helped. Moreover, Angel had serious problems with behavior and anger. Therefore, there was nothing in his room. The boy simply destroyed all things regardless of their value. Denise felt helpless and responsible for her child and just did everything in her power. As a mother, she had to be sure that her son would not harm himself or anyone else, and she simply could not just give up on him. Confirmation of Denise's words could be found in her diary, where she wrote down everything that happened with Angel for three years. There were recommendations from doctors and conversations with a priest. The woman described every step of hers, built an upbringing plan, tried various approaches to this difficult child. After Denise was charged, she tried to hand these notes over to the police to explain her behavior, but they simply ignored it. The eldest son, Carlos, fully corroborated his mother's words about both the boarded up windows and the empty room. The boy said that Angel was constantly eager for freedom, not wanting to lead a normal life. After all, the lack of control in childhood apparently left an imprint on his behavior. Carlos said that Denise had never insulted her sons, but Angel could easily attack with his fists. The boy even felt incredible aggression towards animals, offending the dogs kept in the house. All this information made the police wonder if Denise's arrest was a mistake, and this soon became apparent. Both boys were given to a foster family where Angel immediately had problems with behavior and outbursts of aggression and violence towards his foster parents. The boy fought with the father of the family and blackmailed him. He threatened to complain to the police that he was being mistreated if the man did not indulge his desires. This is the very maneuver he performed at the Hallowell house. It got to the point that other families began to refuse Angel. The charges against Denise were dropped and now she had the most difficult task of restoring her shattered reputation. No matter how pure your intentions are, there will always be someone who will find negative aspects in them. It wasn't easy to get back on track. It took Denise a year to secure another job as a teacher. Her students were individuals suffering from autism, and as an educator, she was successful. But before that, she had to surmount a lot. Her boys were still not with her, Although Denise was a great mother to them, she attended all their sports events, took them on vacation, was very attentive and involved in their lives. After all, she loved them and wanted them to have their own permanent home. In the end, she managed to get Carlos back. But regarding Angel, the specialists advised her to think carefully, since after the events that transpired, it would not be easy for both of them. By law, she could take him back, but the social welfare authorities recommended that Denise relinquish her parental rights for the child's benefit, which the woman did, although it was a very painful choice for her. This was the story of the Hallowell family before the tragic events when Denise was found with a fractured skull in her own bed. Rumors and speculations immediately began to circulate in the community that the person responsible for the death could be her son, Angel who harbored a grudge against his adoptive mother, and this could have been close to the truth. But such a possibility was soon refuted, since the boy was in a juvenile detention center at that time, and therefore could not have been involved in Denise's death. The police made every effort to uncover what actually happened. They searched in the air, on the ground, and even checked the lake. Canine services and volunteer search groups were involved. A survey of neighbors in this area revealed rather alarming information. Many believed that Denise might have become a target for some reason, because recently, strange things had begun to occur in their area. People began to notice that the flow of cars entering and leaving this area had increased. Then, a mysterious fire happened in the Hallowell house, the cause of which was never established. Neighbors said that Denise's pets had disappeared several times. 
The inhabitants of the house were also worried about their safety. They even installed a camera and hung signs near their property indicating video recording. However, all this was just speculation because from the first day, the police already had someone in their sights. It was none other than Carlos, the boy from Guatemala whom Denise adopted at the age of four. After receiving a call from him to 911, the patrol officers found the boy on the street. Carlos was literally going crazy when he was told that Denise had passed away. Since he was the only person who was at home at the time, he was taken to the station for interrogation. The young man recounted what he and his mother were doing that day. Everything was as usual. In the morning, they went on business to the funeral of a family friend, then returned home, buying two pies at a bakery on the way. At home, they had a snack of fresh-baked goods and decided to take a little nap. Each went to their own bedroom. Carlos watched some YouTube videos before falling asleep. Then at some point he woke up, answered a few messages, and fell asleep again. The boy was fast asleep when the dogs started barking outside, although they were usually kept on the other side of the house. At first he thought that Denise had let them out, but the barking did not stop, and Carlos, shaking off the remnants of drowsiness, got up and went outside. Then he noticed that the front door was wide open. After calling out to the four-legged pets, the young man looked around for his mother, but she was nowhere to be seen. Then he decided to check the bedroom and stumbled upon a terrible sight. Denise was lying on the bed with an axe sticking out of her head. The boy heard her trying to breathe but didn't know what to do so as not to aggravate the situation. Carlos even tried to shake his mother slightly, but she did not respond. When the police asked Carlos who he thought could have done such a thing, he said that his mother had no enemies. The only people she communicated with always treated her warmly. They themselves lived in such a wilderness that they could hardly bother anyone. For some reason, Carlos's story did not inspire confidence in the investigators. Most likely it was because they already had some information that helped form a more complete picture. There were no signs of a break-in, and the theory of an intruder looked far-fetched from the very beginning. The relationship between mother and son was not really as good as Carlos described. Just a few months ago, the police were called to the Hallowell home after the son attacked his mother. As a result, the woman received a concussion and broke her arm. When the boy was reminded of this incident, he reported that after that, he and Denise had reconciled, and besides, their quarrel could not be called a fight. They just pushed each other. Then he apparently realized how it looked from the outside, and his story changed abruptly. Carlos informed the guardians of order that his mother constantly insulted him, could hit him in the face, head, back, everything she could reach. After that quarrel, he even moved out of her house. The young man complained that he had mental health problems. This was confirmed by his acquaintances and friends. He really looked anxious and tense. It was at that time that Carlos began to heavily use illegal drugs and even thought about voluntary suicide. Denise took him to a clinic where a doctor prescribed Carlos medication for depression and also diagnosed him with suspected bipolar disorder. After treatment, the young man felt much better. His mood stabilized, he and his mother mended their relationship, and he returned home. However, the correction of the situation was due to the fact that Denise agreed with the list of demands of her adopted son. Carlos wanted his mother to buy him a reliable car for trips to college. After he turned 18, she would still have to make a financial contribution to his college education, and these were not just demands on paper. The boy wanted Denise to sign it and have it notarized. Such were the complicated relationships that developed in the Hallowell family. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this video. It's really important. According to reports from Denise's neighbor and closest friend, Emmy, the mother was truly afraid of her son when he became addicted to psychotropic substances. The woman even installed several cameras to monitor what was happening and asked Emmy to take care of her dogs if something happened to her. During the interrogation, Carlos behaved a little defiantly and was very offended when the officers told him about their suspicions. He stated that he would never harm his mother. She was the only person he truly loved. Despite all the detectives' attempts to make him confess, he did not break down and continued to claim that he was not involved in his mother's death. 
Since the police currently had no specific evidence, they had to release Carlos. Because he was only 17 years old, he could not stay alone in the house. The investigators tried to take the teenager to his girlfriend's house, but the girl's parents, who had always been favorably disposed to their friendship, refused to accept him. The whole situation with Denise looked suspicious, and they did not want to create unnecessary problems for themselves because of this boy. Not only his girlfriend and her parents turned away from Carlos, but some friends also began to distance themselves over time. There was a hint of falsehood in his stories about his mother. The only person who agreed to have the young man in her home was Emmy, Denise's friend. She was so devastated by the death of a close person with whom she planned to meet old age next door that despite all her fears, she took Carlos to her place. The woman tried to keep him busy so that he could endure the loss of his mother, helped him plan Denise's funeral, and stayed with him as much as possible. Only in Emmy's soul was there a fear that the young man had something to do with what happened to her friend. At night, she locked the door to her bedroom and listened for extraneous sounds for a long time. At the same time, she felt very guilty about this feeling. Carlos was perhaps just a little boy, frightened by such tragic events. However, as soon as she saw that there was not a drop of sadness in his eyes, suspicions revived again. Meanwhile, Carlos was not grieving at all. He seemed more excited about getting an inheritance than about the absence of Denise in his life. However, despite outward manifestations in his diary, he wrote how much he missed his mother and asked her to come back, not to leave him, that he would never be able to get the vision of how she lay completely motionless out of his head. All these inconsistencies clearly indicated psychological problems. Nine weeks later, the police called Carlos for another interrogation. He insisted that after finding his mother in a terrible state, he did not leave the house. However, his mobile phone showed otherwise. The teenager was near the lake. The boy tried to object, but when he was told that divers had already searched the reservoir and found something at the bottom, he broke down and told a completely different version of events. The detective pulled out a box to show Carlos the items found in the water. There were three surveillance cameras that previously hung in the house's corridors and Denise's cell phone. Unfortunately, the police could not get any useful information from these devices since they had been in the water for some time. But Carlos did not know about this, so he was overwhelmed with panic. Before that, he had already told investigators that there were no cameras inside the house and the one outside was broken. During the search, the police noticed that in those places where the recording devices were once attached, there were characteristic traces, and there were also cables for connection everywhere. So the boy lied. Since the cameras themselves were not in the house, the detectives decided to search the entire area around the building, including the bottom of the lake. Now Carlos's narrative was based on the fact that he did not remember anything. He and Denise returned home from a family friend's funeral, had a snack of pies, and went to rest. The teenager woke up to the dogs barking, found his mother with an ax in the back of her head, and called the emergency service. The only thing was that now he already allowed the thought that he could have done it himself, but somehow it was erased from his memory. He panicked, tore off all the cameras, grabbed his mother's phone, and for some reason threw it into the water. But this was also a lie, because based on the data from his mobile phone, the police already knew that on that day he did not even go to bed. Carlos was using his gadget all the time. Caught in another lie, he again slightly changed the story. The boy said that he remembered sharpening an axe for some reason, and the next memory was an axe sticking out of his own mother's head. But how it happened he did not understand. It was definitely not planned. He was brought to his senses by the blood streaming from Denise's nose. The young man, Realizing what he had done, wanted to fix it and immediately called 911 in the hope of saving the life of his mother, the woman who completely changed his present. He insisted that he did not understand how he could attack her. It was some kind of clouding of the mind. Now that he had confessed, he felt better, but his soul was gnawed by guilt. He would never be able to forgive himself for what he had done. The reason Carlos was able to hack his mother with an axe was that the woman verbally insulted him, often humiliated him, told him that he was a loser, 
and how disappointed she was in his behavior. In part, this was true, because witnesses were found who confirmed this, and there were several audio recordings where Denise scolded her son. On the day when the teenager wanted to take his own life and crashed into a tree in a car, Denise was more worried about the damage done to her red pickup truck than about the fact that her son might have been trying to commit suicide. She was so upset by the damage to the truck that she began to reproach her son again, saying that it was only thanks to her that he lived in the United States. It's hard to learn that the victim was not actually a good person either, or at least did not correspond to the concepts of a loving mother. However, this does not mean that she deserved a terrible death at the hands of her adopted son. From the outside, their relationship always looked very close and trusting, and many were jealous. The truth began to come out only after the death of Denise. For the first seven years, everything really went well. At the age of 11, the teenager tried alcohol, weed, and intoxicating pills. Moreover, he himself began to engage in their distribution. This explains why various cars began to arrive in such a remote area and some suspicious individuals began to appear. Once upon a time, Carlos did well in school, but now his performance dropped sharply, and then he was completely expelled from the school's graduation class. He managed to hide it from his mother for several months. When Denise finally found out, she set herself the goal of putting the child back on the right path. Perhaps out of desperation, she told him all these unpleasant things. At first, Carlos silently listened to all the reproaches and insults from his mother, then took an ax and went into the forest, where he began to chop trees, visualizing that his mother was in front of him. He remembered all the offensive words she said in the heat of the moment and vented his anger on the pine trunks, and then returned home. On that day, July 13th, 2019, after the funeral, he and Denise had a big fight. She again began to reproach him about his friends and his destructive addiction. Carlos told his mother that he wanted to go to technical college instead of a four-year school, but Denise rejected this idea as not corresponding to what she wanted for her son. The woman refused to pay for his studies, calling her son a loser and the main disappointment in her life. At the end of the conversation, tears appeared in his eyes, after which the teenager took an ax and took his mother's life. Carlos was arrested. The young man's first question was how soon he would be released, because he was going to go to college. And when he learned that he would go to prison, he was very upset because of the presence of a future criminal record. The boy was interested in whether it could somehow be removed from the records later, so that it would not affect his future life. In general, he behaved far from like an adult, and was so detached from reality that he did not understand the essence of what was happening. Carlos was tried as an adult, despite the fact that at the time of the crime he was 17 years old. The prosecution insisted on the premeditation of the young man's actions. He did not plead guilty, and the defense insisted that his actions were not planned initially. He succumbed to emotions. The lawyer stated that Carlos had mental health problems and the feelings of a child who was abandoned in early childhood. All this, combined with Denise's aggressive and harsh parenting style, made him short-tempered. The defense convinced the jury that the boy was subjected to psychological abuse by his deceased mother, and that is why he took her life. The jury was not told that Carlos had previously had a brother, or that Denise had previously been accused of child abuse. The prosecution, in turn, painted a picture of a selfish child who chose the wrong path and was angry because his mother tried to impose her own principles on him and did not let him live the way he wanted. And Carlos liked to drink alcohol, smoke weed, and take intoxicating substances. He dreamed of throwing parties, not studying in a four-year school, but at the same time, Denise fully financed him, regardless of whether she agreed with such a life or not. The prosecutor added that Miss Hallowell did not deserve to die. She did everything that any mother in her place would do, and all this was for the future of her son. The jury retired for deliberation. After an hour and a half, they returned with a decision to find Carlos Hallowell guilty of his mother's death. It remained only to wait for the sentence. Although the boy was tried as an adult because of his age, he could not be subjected to the death penalty. He faced from 40 years to life imprisonment. 
The judge had to take into account 10 different factors when making a decision, including the nature of the crime, Carlos's mental state, and everything that the defense and prosecution team said in their speeches. Ultimately, the judge concluded that Carlos Hallowell was an incorrigible criminal who had no chance of rehabilitation. He made an independent choice in favor of alcohol and prohibited drugs. His immaturity at the time of the crime had nothing to do with the fact that he committed the crime, given that the defendant attacked his mother when she was in the most vulnerable state. It was not a sudden surge of emotions, a state of passion. The motive for the crime was Denise's money, real estate, her car, and all her property. Experts who met with Carlos determined that he had 16 out of 20 criteria for a psychopathological syndrome manifested in the form of heartlessness towards others, a reduced ability to empathize, a lack of sincere remorse, and other signs. A person suffering from such a syndrome is not capable of rehabilitation. During the sentencing hearing, Carlos made a statement to the court, but in reality he was simply talking to his deceased mother, saying that she could hear everything, that she was not there with him. In the words addressed to Denise, the young man expressed remorse and regret for his wrongdoing. At such a young age, Carlos Hallowell was sentenced to life in prison because he committed an unforgivable and irreparable crime against the person closest to him. His sentence can be reviewed after 25 years, in 2044. Carlos himself seemed to have come to terms with his sad fate and accepted what he had done. Some time later, he even gave an interview. Finally, he was able to tell the whole story of his crime from his own perspective. Carlos told journalists that for some time, he and Denise had everything going wonderfully. Their relationship changed and everything went downhill as soon as Angel appeared in the house. The mother changed, became more tense, aggressive, and as a result, very cruel. After Denise's arrest, when both sons were taken away from her, everything became completely different. At some point, it seemed to Carlos that he had lost his home again and was deprived of everything he had, but at the same time, he felt a kind of freedom and impunity. After returning to Denise's house, there was no longer the closeness between the son and mother that there was initially. Then, when he got older, he realized that his mother expected too much from him. She wanted him to become more independent and start making a financial contribution to the household. Every time he got into bad company or relapsed, she became more and more disappointed in him. That day, they had a big fight over the technical college where Carlos wanted to go to study, and Denise said too much. When she fell asleep, the young man was working in the yard, chopping something with an axe. Then he wanted to drink. He entered the house. His mother's last words were spinning in his head. Carlos looked into the room and saw that Denise was sleeping. Then he raised the axe and swung with all his might, trying not to look at her. There was no real reason to take her life. He himself admitted it and agreed that his mother did not deserve it. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.